Hey guys, my name is Dave Cummings. I am a microbiology professor at Point Linda Nazarene University, and I am uh, creating a, a short series of videos introducing you to coronaviruses. Uh, in this first video, we're going to look at the basics of coronaviruses, and then we'll move into more specifically the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus and the disease COVID-19. So in this video, we're going to talk about uh, some basics of coronaviruses in general. Now, typically coronaviruses infect us uh, in the upper respiratory tract, and they cause what we think of as the common cold. There are actually hundreds of viruses that cause what we think of as a mild upper respiratory viral infection. We say we have a cold. Coronaviruses are among some of the most important cold viruses. Um, we're going to look at the structure of coronaviruses in general. We're going to look at how they get in and how they get out. And then two of the more uh, severe versions of coronaviruses that we've seen in the past called SARS and MERS, and that'll set us up in a later video to talk more about COVID. So if we look first at the physical structure of coronaviruses, we see that they are enveloped viruses, which means that they have a phospholipid bilayer membrane wrapped around them. Uh, that they stole from their last host cell as they exited. So that membrane they did not create, that membrane came from, um, in, uh, in the case of human coronaviruses, it came from the epithelial tissue of human cells, or from the human cells of epithelial tissue. Inside the envelope, you see that we have a helical capsid made up of repeating capsomere monomers. And inside that helical capsid, we have a single-stranded RNA genome. <clears throat> there are glycoprotein spikes on the surface, typical of, of all envelope viruses. And I like this image here of a coronavirus because you can see exactly uh, what's being illustrated. So here it is on the surface of a human cell. Here we've got the phospholipid bilayer membrane. You can't see the nucleocapsid on the inside but you can certainly see the glycoprotein spikes circling all the way around. They got their name coronavirus because apparently they, uh, they reminded somebody early on of uh, sun flares, uh, and so corona as in the surface of the sun. So anyway, that's, uh, that's the root of, of the naming system there. Rhinoviruses are the most common cause of colds. Coronaviruses are the second most common, so this is a very abundant type of virus that we've all seen at one point or another. Now typical of enveloped viruses, they get in two cells by way of membrane fusion. So the S protein, the spike protein, actually has two subunits, an S1 and an S2 subunit. The S1 subunit binds to a, a, a protein on the surface of human epithelial cells called ACE2. ACE2 is the receptor for S1 uh, glycoprotein spike pro, uh, of, of coronaviruses. And so that's the initial attachment uh, that takes place. And so the way that the virus finds the surface of a cell that it can infect is by interaction between the S1 subunit of the spike and the ACE2 protein on the surface of human epithelial tissues. Now the spike protein has a second component called S2, and S2 interacts with Another uh, receptor, essentially, on the surface of human cells called TMPRSS2. TMPRSS2 is found throughout the human body. It's, it's absolutely everywhere. And so there's at least the theoretical potential for coronaviruses to infect just about any tissue. Uh, in reality, though, the uh, TMPRSS2 protein is found most commonly in our nose and in our lungs. And so most of what we see with coronavirus infections are going to be upper respiratory, and they, they do hold the potential for actually infecting and invading the lungs. Now what happens when the S2 protein binds to this other receptor is it actually initiates the process of membrane fusion. So the membrane on the coronavirus fuses with the membrane of the human host cell, dumping its contents into the cytoplasm. And so our protein capsid with our positive single-stranded RNA genome is going to get uh, delivered into the cytoplasm that way. Uh, enzymes inside our cells will degrade the capsomeres from the capsid, exposing the, uh, the single-stranded RNA, which will then start to be expressed, expressing all of its genes 
to replicate, make more viruses, etc. So if it's getting in by membrane fusion, that implies that it gets out by budding. And so as it's ready to leave the cell after more virus particles have been made, these nucleocapsids that you see here are going to aggregate at the interior of the, the host cell, and they're going to trigger exocytosis. And so by exocytosis, the host cell membrane is going to create a vesicle that then captures like a little bubble the nucleocapsid and leaves, and then that becomes the next infectious particle. Now, getting out of the entire human body takes a little bit more than just budding out of an individual cell. Respiratory droplets, uh, and to some degree aerosols, which the difference between droplets and aerosols is really just sort of a cutoff mark uh, in size. Respiratory droplets are considered anything larger than 5 micrometers. Aerosols are smaller than 5 micrometers. They're made up of saliva and mucus, and they contain microorganisms in them. We release them at a very low level when we breathe, a little bit higher level when we talk, a much higher level when we cough, and as you can see in this picture, a tremendously higher level when we sneeze. Uh, the purpose of many of the mitigation uh, policies and procedures that we have, such as sneezing or coughing into the, the crook of your arm, or wearing a mask um, anytime you're around other people is to take what you see in this picture here and deaden it so that it drops right then and there and literally falls to the ground. That's exactly where it goes. Um, some of the particles obviously leak out. Masks aren't perfect. The crook of your arm isn't perfect. But with nothing in front of your face, what you get is what you see with this little girl sneezing here. It's a, it's a very compelling picture <laughs> to make us want to capture our uh, capture our our sneezes and our coughs but speaking and even just breathing can slowly but surely also release these respiratory droplets 33 degrees celsius is the temperature inside our noses the rest of your body the core of your body is at 37 degrees celsius most microorganisms are adapted to 37 degrees celsius coronavirus is actually adapted to 33 and so the location where they find the most abundant receptors to attach to, the nose, also is the location where they are most uh, best adapted to the temperature. And so this is why we don't tend to see coronaviruses going a lot deeper than the nose. Now, coronavirus respiratory syndromes are the more severe forms, right? So if we've got the common cold as the most common way that coronaviruses uh, infect us, there are some respiratory syndromes that are much more severe. The two that we've dealt with in recent history are SARS and MERS. Many of you may remember those two. <clears throat> SARS stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. SARS was, um, SARS was a very short-lived, very intense uh, outbreak in 2003. I'll show you a, a, a figure, a graph in a minute that shows you where that, that happened. Uh, and then it was very quickly contained. MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, had its, its initiation in 2012, and a lot of the damage was done in that early time period, but there are still some MERS cases popping up here and there. So whereas SARS does not appear to be ongoing, it was squashed within about six or seven months, MERS appears to be very slowly but surely still making its way around. The signs and symptoms of these coronavirus respiratory syndromes include a fever, so a temperature greater than 38 degrees Celsius, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, malaise, that's just the term for bleh, just feeling just tired and don't want to move and don't want to do anything. You, you know what I'm talking about. We've all felt that. Body aches are very common with coronavirus respiratory syndromes. Um, about 10 to 20 percent of the cases induce diarrhea. And then after about seven days, all of these symptoms seem to also add on to them a dry cough, so a non-productive cough. It doesn't produce a lot of mucus. And often pneumonia. That's when they tend to find their way down into our lungs. Now, the SARS outbreak back in 2003 originated in Asia. You can see the hot spot here where the greatest number of cases were in China. It originated in Asia in the spring of 2003 spread to other nations globally. You can get a sense of where it found its way to through human movement, right? We can hop on airplanes and cars and, and we can 
cruise the planet pretty easily. And so we tend to be real important vectors for spreading these. During that spring or during that year in 2003, um, and like I said, it ended in 2003, there were 8,098 confirmed cases, 8,098, resulting in 774 deaths. So it had a 9.6% mortality or death rate. So about 10% of the people that got SARS died from SARS. And a little over 8,000 people for sure got the infection. Uh, it's widely believed that what allowed the world, the global health community, to knock this thing down and control it was very rapidly quarantining individual cases and then requiring masks, uh, which already culturally in Asia wasn't a big sell. In the United States, it's been a lot harder. Um, but wearing masks to, like you saw, deaden sneezes, coughs, those respiratory droplets leaving very far from our body and, and really forcing them down to the ground, which is where they go, um, along with quarantining individuals as soon as they got sick. Um, so we can learn some lessons from that, right? And, and hopefully we can, uh, we can take some things away from that. MERS was a little bit different. Uh, so with SARS, um, the source was likely bats. With MERS, the source has been linked to camels, of all things. And so, not surprisingly, the major MERS outbreak was here in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula and the surrounding region. And then, of course, through travel, you know, a handful of cases in the U.S. and China and, and what have you. But, but the hot spot was here, where camels live and where people interact with camel, camels. And I guess camels spit on you. And so they're, they're releasing these respiratory droplets pretty frequently as well. Um, as of when I check this, so today's date is uh, the 28th of April, 2021. Last time I checked this, let's see, so here we go, we've got a date up here. Confirmed global cases of mers cov that's the name of the actual virus, between 2012 and 2017, so I didn't see anything up through 2021, but through 2017 there were 2,580 confirmed cases, so quite a few less, about a third of the case numbers that we saw with SARS. But out of those 858 deaths, that's a 33% mortality rate. So MERS didn't appear to spread quite as easily across the planet, um, whether that's because of human intervention or something biological, it's not clear. But people who did get it had a one in three chance that they weren't going to survive it. So the mortality rate was considerably higher. So you can see that properties like the ability to spread or the ability to kill you uh, vary from one coronavirus um, strain to the next. All right, let's go ahead and summarize what we know about coronaviruses in general. We know that they're a large family of related viruses that cause a wide range of disease, but in particular, they cause the common cold. And then there are these more severe respiratory syndromes that they're associated with as well. They're enveloped helical single-stranded RNA viruses that enter the respiratory epithelial cells by membrane fusion. And they exit those cells by budding, which is essentially the opposite of membrane fusion. And then they exit the human host through respiratory droplets from breathing, talking, coughing, sneezing, in that order. Sneezing being the worst, obviously, uh, releasing the most particles. They're spread by droplet transmission that we just talked about. Very little spread through physical um, uh, inanimate surfaces, things like you know your pen that you're chewing on or your computer, or your laptop, for example. And then SARS and MERS are important coronavirus respiratory syndromes with severe symptoms and high mortality. And, and MERS has a much higher mortality than SARS, but then SARS at 10% obviously has a much higher mortality than the common cold, which is essentially zero mortality. People don't die from colds. So I hope this introduction to what coronaviruses are in general is helpful. In the next video, we're going to zoom in on specifically what's called SARS-CoV-2 which is the coronavirus that is causing the current COVID-19 outbreak. Thanks, guys, and I will see you on the next video.